just a lot of people this morning, and I know we got quite a few people out. Do me a solid, give Kira a hand clap, please, one time, because she has literally been sick all week long. Um, she went to the doctor, she thought she had strep, and she thought she had COVID, and, uh, and she had neither. She just had a really bad cold, and I asked her, said, you want to sing? And she was like, yeah, so she's been practicing all night, just been trudging through it. So she really, I was like, you still want to sing that verse by yourself? And she did, and that's one of my favorite songs, something about the way you move, Jesus. I love that song. We are, <clears throat> if you look around and you see some people that are not here, we have quite a few people that are sick this morning. Um, so if you see somebody that is not here, please reach out to them. Please reach out to them. Let them know that you care. Let them know that they are on your mind and all that good stuff. And if they're not sick, say, why were you not in church this morning? Uh, so, uh, and, and also, if you guys notice, this is going to look different when we're done with it, I promise, okay? This is just the shell. I built this all by myself. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I had a lot of help. But, <laughs> but I had Eric and I had Wayne and, and Ricky and Wolfgang came by and they all um, just sort of kind of, it was a collage of things. Um, me and Wayne did something. Ricky came and said, that's wrong. And then he cut it off, literally cut it off. Um, and, and then, you know, it, it's going to look great once we're done. Uh, we're going to be working on that this week. But we want to make sure that the worship experience here is palatable. Um, and, and I know I'm not dumb to the fact that the drums were loud. They were very loud. So we're trying to fix that with, with this uh, monstrosity, and I know it looks huge, but I promise you it's not, it is not this huge, humongous drum booth. It's actually about the average size. So that we got that going on. We also have our children's room. That's getting fixed. So we have a lot of things going on, a ton of things. If you ask Ricky, the children's room would have been halfway done yesterday had I not had him on this project. It's a lie. But, <laughs> but uh, they have really worked really hard, and they have really poured in to the church. So I'm, I'm excited to see what God is going to do next. But as I said, if you see somebody that's usually here, reach out to them as early as this today while I was out there drinking coffee, I was finding out people that were just not feeling well. Wolfgang was here yesterday. He was not feeling well. And he asked me, do you have a mask? And I was like, why do you need a mask, Wolfgang? Because if you know me, I don't do germs. So I'm glad he did not come this morning. Hopefully he's watching online because he still needs Jesus. But we are in week four of our series entitled Counter Culture. And we are in the process of trying to change the mindset of our church. We have been going over this for the, I'm going to pull a chair up here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a gout flip and I'm trying to walk around, I ain't working out too much. But we are in week four of our series, Counter Culture. And we have been in the process of trying to change the mindset and dynamic of our church. I am a firm believer that God will not put on us, and I know this scripture is talking about sin and things like that, but I believe in life God will not put on us more than we're ready for. If God is truly our Father, he's not going to put us in a place of failure. Now, we can run into a place of failure. You know what? I could tell my daughter, Alana, she's been asking me for weeks now, Dad, can I drive? Absolutely not, Alana. Can I drive? Absolutely not. She said, Brantley got to drive. I was like, Brantley drove one week before his 15th birthday. Calm down. I said, yeah, sure. One week before your 15th birthday. So I'm trying to set her up for success. Here's something that my daughter can't do. It would be really stupid. She'd get my car keys, hop in my vehicle, and we'll drive. That's failure. So I'm trying to get us to a place to where we're set up for success by making sure that we're ready before we bring other people in here to get them ready. Amen. Yeah. And all throughout this series... I have literally heard phone call and text message saying, Vince, I've used this and that that God has spoken through you. Here's the crazy thing about messages, and, and Quentin and Ricky, I'm sure they can attest to this. When, when pastors preach, we're not speaking to you. We're having a conversation with God, and you're just privileged enough to be privy to it. Amen. When most of these messages, I don't know about you, but God has been convicting me. Because it's things that I, as an individual, notice how I didn't say pastor, but as an individual, things that I should have been working on in my, in my own life. So God has been like, Vince, let's stop and let's reevaluate some things in your life. Let me ask you guys a question. Has between Reset and this counterculture series, has it changed your life in any form or fashion? Give me a yes or a no. All right, you can be honest. Those that didn't say yes, I'm going to take that as a no. But, <laughs> but today, if you said yes, hopefully... This message here 
it will stir your heart. Because this is the end. This is the one where we actually go out and we set forth and we do what God has called us to do. I said these past four, these past three weeks, of this whole series actually, has been the selfish series. This series has been about north. It's been about our church. When we do things with our ministry, we have meetings. And we have, or whenever I do concerts, we have a green room. And we'll have a production meeting. And no one comes in that meeting unless you are part of the production. And the reason why I say this is a selfish series is because this is for us. This is about changing North Church. This isn't about, I'm not, I love 101 Church, but this isn't about them. I love Crossview, but this isn't about them. I, I love uh, the, the Methodist Church right over here, but this isn't about them. This one is about North Church. The thing that I've been pounding into our minds and into our hearts is found in 1 Peter 2, and it says this. This is the message version. It says, it's up here on the screen. It says, but you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work. It says, chosen to be a holy people. Now, if you stop and you look at the word holy, you can't just be like, because a lot of times we think of holy and all of a sudden we hear angels like, ah, wait, that's the mermaid. Just imagine, <laughs> angels in your mind, all right? <laughs> I don't know why the little mermaid came to mind, but that's what first came. All right, so, <laughs> oh, man. Think about angels, and I forgot what I was going Oh, holy people. All right. So when you think about holy people, don't think about just this angelic angel sound. Don't think about that. He, here's the writer, Peter. He gives, the writer of Peter, he actually gives us a definition. It's God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him and to tell others of the night and day difference he made in you from nothing into something from rejected to accepted. Here's the thing I want us to understand. The writer of Peter was not saying you have to be perfect. That's not what he was saying. That's not an expectation of God because there's something on the sanctification and sanctification does not end until you stand before your father and he makes you new. What he's saying is this, is my expectation is for you to be like Christ. That's my expectation. Not perfect, but leading others to him. This person told me the other day, said, <clears throat> you say be like Christ. What does that even mean? It means every moment of my life is dedicated to point something to someone to my father. It's one of the hardest things you will do. I was at at and I talked about it on the bullpen. If you're not catching the bullpens, we usually do it every Friday. This last week it was Saturday. But I talked about it on the bullpen. I was in the at and store, and I was talking to this guy. And he was talking to me about phone plans, and I just left T-Mobile. We had been with him for 19 years, and I had left, and I said, I'm going with AT&T. And we're talking, and we're talking about the phone plans. And somehow the conversation switched from the phone plan to his family. And here's the crazy thing. I didn't badmouth T-Mobile. I didn't say, before we sign this contract, let's pray. I didn't say, you know what John 3.16 says? It says you're going to hell. See, I didn't do that. We just talked. I had to go back in, and he remembered my name. He remembered exactly who I was. He remembered everything about that day. I asked about his kids and his wife and his family. I go back in again, and we're just laughing and we're talking. But this time I'm on my phone. I can't remember exactly who I was talking to, but it was about the church. And I said, all right, man, I love you. Talk to you later. God bless. And we hung up the phone. And it was at that moment in time that he asked me, he said, I thought you owned a marketing company. You tell your customers that you love them? And I was like, well, if I did, it's none of your business. But I said, no, man, that was somebody from my church. I'm a pastor also. And, and here's the thing. I don't like telling people that because people become really weird when you say I'm a pastor. They become real strange. Like, it's like their butt cheeks tighten up, and they're just like this. Like, they stop slashing. They're like, oh, God so loved the world, and they start quoting scripture. Like, no, I'm not that type of pastor. Like, if you saw last week's sermon, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but uh, side note, I didn't cuss last week. I just want to put that out there. We're going to move forward. But <laughs> I said I'm not that type of pastor. I'm the type of pastor that I understand I'm not perfect. 
I am, I am blessed to stand on a platform and preach thus saith the Lord, not because of who I am, but because of who Christ is in and through me. That's what 1 Peter 2.9 is talking about. It's going out there and saying, I am not perfect, but I am making it day by day, not because of me, but because of who, who Christ is through me. The first week I talked about when you go against culture, when you go against the culture, what's going to happen is you may feel the fire. We talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I, my closing slide was, it was written by a very profound, great writer. He's a rapper by the name of Bone Crusher. And he wrote this, these lyrics, never scared. And I said, no matter how hot the fire gets, because here's the reality. When you go out there and you go against the grain, when you go out there and you refuse to hate somebody because they're a different race than you, when you go out there and you refuse to get caught up in the chaos of the world, and instead of shouting, get them out of the White House, get them out from behind the pulpit, burn them at the stake, instead of shouting that, I use my lungs and my time to say Jesus saves because every breath belongs to him. See, that's... That's what counterculture means. Then week two, I talked about remember your moment. And I said, there's going to be people in the world that needs a moment with Jesus. We've got options. See, we can take them to the foot of Christ, and we can tell him, she's not worthy, he's not worthy, kill them, burn them, get rid of them. Or we can take them to the foot of, uh, foot of Christ and say, can you give them the same moment that you gave me? And last week, we spoke about keep the change, which was one of the hardest messages that I've ever had to preach. Because I stopped having to look at how much time I was giving God. Because I was sitting back and I was saying, well, I go to church and I'm there from, you know, 8.30 in the morning until about 8.30 at night. Oh, and then Monday, I dedicate usually to church stuff. And then Wednesday, either Quentin or I are doing Bible study. Friday, I'm doing, bo- and I had to stop doing that. And I had to stop saying, Vince, why are you putting a time limit on, on the power of God? And I had to say, God, what, whatever my life is, whatever broken, messed up, disgusting thing this is, it's yours. You keep the change. And this week, we're closing it out. This is the week where you separate the winners from the spectators. This is the week where we take everything that we have learned over the past two series from reset to counterculture, and we go out there. We don't just read about it and speak about it and say amen to it, but we actually live it. Vince Lombardi, he put it this way. He said, winning is not a sometime thing. It's an all-the-time thing. You don't win once in a while. You do things right once in a while. And it says this, it says, you do them right all the time. Winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is losing. Here's the reality. We can take everything that we've learned about in these past few series, and we'd be like, man, those are great series. That really touched my heart. And we can keep it stored on the inside, or we can go out and we can actually put it in action. My daughter, <clears throat> the other day I was talking to my daughter, and she was telling me about work. And my daughter, Kira, and she was telling me how, you know, she works at work and how the people in the back, how they don't work and how they're, you know, they just goof off and play and all this other stuff. And I was like, you got to keep working. And she was like, Dad, I keep working. And, and, and now her, her directors are getting to notice her. And all these other people are getting to notice her. And, but see, the thing about Akira is this, is when she was young, she was like, I'm so shy. I'm so shy. I don't like people. And she still don't like people, but that's because she's mean. But when she was younger, <laughs> she had, like, social anxiety stuff going on. And now she goes into work, whether she's sick or healthy or whatever in between, and she gives it 110%, and that's recognized by people around her. My daughter, Asia, she does the same thing. She goes into work. They stick her outside. I've been to my daughter's job before, and, and I pass by. it. They don't realize I, I spy on my kids. Boy, I'm, I'm that parent. I'd be like, they still at work? That's me. I'm that guy. And I drive by. She'll be outside two hours. Go by two hours later. She's still outside. And I'm just like, dang, why don't you go inside? Then I go through just to check on her. I go through, order me some overpriced cookies that are usually hard as a rock. But it's okay. It's Jesus chicken. So I'm okay with paying. It's like paying tithes and offering, okay? So I go through this line, and I check on my kid. And she's still, I'm her dad, right? She's like, hi, how can I help you? I'm like, are you serious? 
this how we talking? Why can't we do this at home? I ordered my food. She's like, my pleasure. I'm like, I want you to say this when I ask you to wash the dishes. That's the same. I want that exact same energy, all right? But my daughter, my daughters, when they go to work, they give it 110%. Now, granted, they get a paycheck in return. But my daughters, we have instilled in them a work ethic. We've instilled in them that when you go to work, you get 110%. Not any less, you give it all. And they have accelerated at their jobs. And we talked about quiet quitting last year, last week. And I said, when you quiet quit in one aspect of your life, you quiet quit in every aspect of your life. Here's a moment where you guys can quiet quit. Here's a moment where you can say, I went to church, I heard the sermon, I heard it all, and now I'm done. But my hope and my prayer is this, is that you don't stop here, but you take the scripture, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, and you run with it. Watch, let me tell you what it says, just in case you forgot, it says this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Notice how the second word that he says is go. He didn't say think about it. He didn't say consider it. He didn't say weigh the options. A couple weeks ago, I said we cannot put out spiritually as though it's an investment hoping to get something back in. We have to give out because everything that we do, we want to do it for the glory of God. So when it says therefore go, we have to do one thing, and that's go. And it says, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of age. We've got options. We've got options. We can say, you know what? This is a great series. Let's move on to the next one. Or we can say, you know what? I'm ready to go against the flow. I'm ready to be different. I'm ready to be set apart. I believe that I was chosen for something greater than just clocking in and clocking out. And I'm ready to give the world Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, as we dive into this story, God, I pray that my mind is clear, that their minds are clear, that our ears are open, and that our hearts are ready for you to shape, mold, and do what only you can do, Father. Speak through me and touch me only like you can, Daddy. In your precious and holy name, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. John chapter 6 is the story of how Jesus fed the 5,000. And I've preached on this before, but every time I study scripture, I pull something new out of it. And, and I sat there and I started reading the scripture. And as I read the scripture, I got stuck on one part. And we're going to look at this one part, but I'm going to read up to that one part. And then we're going to stick on that one part for just a minute. And I promise you that today I'm not going to hold you long. But I do want to really ingrain in all of us, myself included, the importance of going against culture, but also the importance of giving everything to God. And it starts off this way. It says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. It says, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And it says, a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was near. Now, you have to understand something very important because this is super important because the people were preparing for the Passover. So there wasn't a lot of exchanging the money. There wasn't a lot of this, that, and the third. They were trying to prepare their houses and their hearts for what was about to come down the pipeline. Hold that in the back of your mind because it's going to make this story seem a lot more impactful. So verse 5, it says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Now, if you read these two different scriptures or these two different stories in two different places, what happens is, as you begin to see that Christ had already spoke to the people. He was actually in the middle of his sermon as he was talking to the people. He said they're beginning to look hungry. Here's point number one that I want us to take away from this. When we go out and we reach people for Jesus, we can't just feed them spiritually. Let me say that again. When we go out and we reach people for Jesus, we can't just feed them spiritually. If the only time you tell somebody in this building hello is on Sunday morning, then there's a problem with that. If the only time that you mention the name of Jesus is on Sunday morning when it's in the middle of a song, there's a problem with that. If the only re reason that people know that you're a Christian is because you wear a shirt that has Jesus or, or something or a cross on it, there's a problem with that. See, Jesus was at this moment and he said, I see them externally while I'm feeding them internally. See, we can go out and we can tell the world, we can stand on the side of the corner with signs that say everyone's going to hell. We can be those people if we want to. But I promise you, 
you are not going to reach as many people as you would if you took the example of Jesus and ran with it. Some of my best ministry is when I call people and I just ask them, how you doing? And I don't give them advice and I don't give them counsel. I just listen. Some people just want you to just shut up and just listen to them. And they want to unload everything that they got going on. And you just sit there and listen. Here's what I found in all my years of ministry is this, is that when I listen, I'm allowing them to make room for God to work in their life. So the next time that I pick up my phone and I actually call them and say, hey, how are you doing? There's room for God to pour things into their life. A pastor once said it this way. You can't fill an already filled cup. The difference is, is what, the, what is the cup filled up with? You can't fill an already filled life. The difference is, is what is the life already filled up with? Christ looked at his disciple and he said, what are we going to feed these people? Where should we buy something? Here's the thing that also I want to make mention of this is this, is when God calls you to do something, he's not going to send you out empty handed. He's not going to send you out there to fail. The next, that scripture in verse six, it says he had all, he asked this only to test him for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. I walk out, and like I said in that first message, I walk out with the mindset of I'm never scared. And I don't walk out with a cockiness. I walk out there with a confidence knowing that God has already directed my steps. And as long as I'm listening to him, I'm good. Most of the time when I'm out of his will is when I'm at Walmart. Every other time, we good. Usually when I go to Walmart, that's when I forget Jesus. And I just be like, I just want to choke everybody in this store. But, but I'm just kidding. Y'all gave me this look. Y'all waiting for me to cuss again. Not cussing. I'm not that angry today. But the reality is this, is that when I'm walking in God's will, I don't have to be scared because he's got me. Philip looked at Christ and he asked this. He said, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. See, here's the other problem with Philip is this, is that he was limiting Christ. He was saying it would take more than half a year's wages for us just to get one piece of bread for everybody to take a bite. So let me ask you a question. When Christ asks you to do something, how much of a limit do you place on him? How much of a limit do you place on Christ when he calls you to take a step of faith? I remember when we first started the takeover ministry, and I remember our first time doing it. I had talked to this artist, B. Rose, and I said, I'm, no, I'm sorry, Ken, and I said, we're going to bring you in. And he gave me a number, and I, I didn't know where the money was going to come from. But I said, Give, send me the contract. I signed the contract. He said, I'm flying in from Africa. Just so that, you know, I'll be there. We're going to have a good time. They flew in from Africa. Still, I had no idea where the money was going to come from, but I talked to my wife, and God God provided. Can I tell you something that before God sends you out to do something that's his will, he already provided. I can preach for us to be a counterculture church with confidence because I know that God would not give me these messages unless he was already ready to provide. I would not go to our church and say, hey, let's build a drum booth. Hey, let's get this children's room started. Hey, let's spend money on all this other kind of stuff. Let's go out there and let's reach our community. Unless I knew that God was going to provide. We just did a vote because our church, we're about to do a huge overhaul on these floors. We're about to have plank flooring and carpet. It's going to be beautiful. And I remember I got this total and I went to our vision team and I said, guys, I know we don't really have this in our budget, but we need to move forward on it and just trust that God is going to provide. Every step that I take, not not just in my life, but with this church, I make with the mindset that God is going to provide. Imagine if we as North Church, we stepped out of this building and we went out there and we invited everybody in the city to this church, not because we want to fill it up, but because we want them to see Jesus. And we did it with confidence, knowing that God was going to provide a word for them. Imagine. Imagine. And Philip said, how are we going to do this? Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and he said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish, but how far will they go amongst so many? How many times have you looked at your life and instead of you looking at how much God has provided you, not materialistically, but spiritually and knowledge and wisdom and you start focusing on what you don't have i tell my kids hey guys they say dad 
can we run to Taco Bell and grab something to eat? I'm like, there ain't nothing at the house to eat. There, there ain't nothing at this house to eat. When I go to the house, I can make an entire Thanksgiving meal with the food we got at our house. See, they ain't never been broke. That's the problem. But I, I, I'm like, I get to the house, open up the fridge, and they're like, all we got is cereal and milk. Well, if you're really hungry, you'll eat cereal and water. But we look at the things that we don't have and we miss the things that we do have. And what happened was, is in the story, they look at the boy who had the five small barley loaves and two small fish. And then instead of them saying, God, can you make this work? They looked and they went out of their own thinking. They said, but how far will they go amongst so many? More church, imagine if we stopped and we said, you know what? I could go out there and I could be different. What am I going to do, little old me? How am I going to change your life? You see, I can't sing like the people that sing worship, so I, I can't go out there and sing and, and attract people. I, I, I'm too nervous to stand up on a platform and preach the gospel like Vince and so many, of, and Quentin and Ricky and Theo. I'm, see, I'm too nervous to do all that. I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. So, no, I can't do that. What can I do for the kingdom of God? Well, I can clean the toilet, but, but see, that won't reach people. And you start thinking about how, how small the things in your life are, are the blessings and the gifts that are in your life, and you start minimizing them, and, and then you refuse to let them go. He, here's the thing that I love about this scripture and about this story. See, in the beginning, it said this. It said that Christ had a plan. And I'm talking slow because this hurts a little bit. <laughs> Christ had a plan, and Christ said, before we even got to this place, to this day, to this moment, I knew that it was going to all work out for the good. And see, the, the reality is this, is that we've been preaching this sermon series about counterculture and about God using us. And you look at your life and you look at your story, and you look at your past, or maybe you look at your present. And, and for some of you, maybe your story, you don't feel like it's big enough. You look and you say, you know what? I never, I, I, I never got addicted to drugs or maybe I, I never fought an illness or I never went through those hard things that you guys talk about. See, my story, it won't capture people. And, and we get so honed in and so focused on those things. And we think that that's what the Bible and what ministry is all about. And I'm telling you, it's not. See, I don't go around and I don't glorify my, my testimony. I don't talk about where I've been because I would rather, rather celebrate where God has brought me. Because, see, here's the reality. Before God brought me to Rockmart, Georgia, before he placed me on this platform, before he brought me to this church, God had already had a plan. Can I tell you something? That I remember when Dean put out the, the post to find a, a musician. He said, this guy named Emmanuel reached out to me. I'll never forget. And they had a rehearsal. And I didn't know Emmanuel from a hole in the wall. And I, I didn't know his wife. I didn't even know he was married at the time. When I first talked to Emmanuel, I felt like he was trying to rush me off the phone. But it's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> and I remember him coming and him playing and everything. And I remember I said, Emmanuel, bro, I want you to leave worship. And Emmanuel was like, okay, cool. And, but then he started a business and he hit me up. And he was like, Vince, I got to step back. And it was cool. But he's like, we ain't going nowhere. And I was like, cool, because y'all know my motto. You leave the church and slash your tires in the name of Jesus. That's just the way it goes. <laughs> North is like a gang. Once you in, you ain't getting out. No, I'm just kidding. But... <laughs> But I, I remember talking to Emmanuel and, and, and really <clears throat> just becoming friends with him. And then my, my, my not my mom, my wife met Yalda. And we decided to all go out to dinner together. And they took us to a Jamaican restaurant. And they had this soup. And I was like, what's in this soup? And it was like goat testicles and a goat head. And I was like, where did they take us? This is not the type of Jamaican food I'm used to. But from that, we grew. And Emmanuel... <laughs> That restaurant's not open anymore, shockingly <laughs> enough. But uh, Emmanuel and I, when they had their baby, they, we, f we found out. Emmanuel sent me a message, and you guys know that it was a rush C-section. It was all sorts of stuff, and Yalda was in the hospital. My wife didn't even know Yalda was in the hospital. And we were able to walk with them through that journey. And 
Can I tell you that before Dean even made that post on Facebook, God knew that that would be part of our family. Here's the thing. God doesn't need a grandiose story to show a grandiose victory. A W is a W. When I used to coach basketball, I told our kids, I said, I don't care if we win by one or 100, we won. Maybe you don't have to get off of drugs in order to come to the cross. Thank God. Maybe you don't have to go through a suicide attempt in order to come to the foot of the cross. Thank God. Maybe you don't have to experience depression and anxiety. Maybe you don't have to go through hell to come to the cross. Thank God. But here's the victory in it. You came to the cross, and before that moment happened, God had a plan for your life. So no matter how big or how small your life may seem, God can use it. Watch this. So they go to the young boy. God already had a plan. And in verse 10, he said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. They sat down. About 5,000 men were there. And listen, it says man, it means man, women, children. It just means human. Jesus then took the loaves. And he gave thanks and distributed to those that were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. I'm one of those pastors. I like to preach about what ifs. Come here, Quentin, real quick. Quentin, I want you to be Jesus today, okay? I know that's going to be hard for you, but I think you can handle it. So imagine. Pull those apart for me and set those up. So <laughs> Imagine if the young boy would have said, nah, man, I'm not giving up this stuff. You don't understand. I, I, I had to go get it. I had to go walk and pick it up. Passover's coming. I, I got prepared. They should have got me. Instead of chasing you, Jesus, they should have been getting their life right. Now, imagine how many churches people walk in today, and that's the way that they treat them. You know what? Instead of you being a mom out of wedlock, you should have gotten your life right. Instead of you being a drug addict, you should have gotten your life right. Instead of you being this, you should have gotten your life right. Instead of you dealing with depression, you should just pray through it. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. You were once there. And just because your story looks different doesn't mean that you didn't need Jesus. But what happens is, is so many of us, we, we say, okay, this is all I have, Jesus. This is it. This is all I have. And God's like, just, I want you to trust me in this. Here, Jesus, you hold that. And you say, okay, Jesus, pour, it, pour me some here. Pour me some. There we go. That's good. Give me a little bit more. There we go. Here, Brittany, you look thirsty. Take this. Why don't you trust me? Man. All right. No, watch. She's like, keep giving it. And then, come here, come here, let me see. Yeah, pour some, pour some here. You go, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Here, Keenan, you, you look thirsty, man. Here, we're about to do communion. You're going to want that. So, <laughs> give, me, give me some more. Give me some more. And then maybe you start giving, and maybe you just start giving a lot. Hold on, let me see that. KK, you like lemonade? There you go. It's a little warmer here today. You take that. All right, here, let me. Let me get another one. Let me get another glass of that lemonade. Oh, yeah. No, see, here you go. Let me see. Here, Jeff. Here you go. You take some lemonade. You better give that to your wife. I'll bring you a glass in just a sec. So, all right. So, no, here you go. Give me that. Give me that. Let me see. Let me see. So, here, here's the thing. So, you give what you got to God, and then all of a sudden what happens is, is he, he says, just give it out. I want you to give it out. You can drink it. It's okay. We're not really doing communion. But <laughs> and then all of a sudden you start looking back, and you're like, wait a second. See, before I started giving all this stuff to God, see, I had more time, I had more friends, I had more money. See, I had, but here, here you go. And, and you're looking back, and God is like, do it again for me. And, and God looks at you, and he's like, but I'm not done with you giving. Watch, here we go. Watch, watch what he says. Give me, give me some glass real quick. Give me some. So he's like, just keep giving. Here we go. All right, there we go. Perfect here. Let me see. Here, you take that, AJ. There you go. You take that lemonade. No, he says, just, just keep giving. Give me some more lemonade here. Thank you, Mr. Jesus Christos. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you. All right, that's good. All right, here you go, Robin. Ah. 
There you go. You take that. Now he's like, now all of a sudden you start looking back and you start noticing that the more you give, the less you have. So watch. He's like, just keep giving. Just, and, and you start getting upset because you're like, every time my phone ring, Pastor Vince wants me to do something. Amen. Pass it around. Pass it to somebody. <laughs> Theo, I heard that. <laughs> See, and he's like, just keep giving. Here you go. Here you go, Kim. I got you. Oh, look, Robin. There you go. <laughs> so I just keep giving. Now, see, you got options. You say, God, this is all I got. I'm not, I can't give anymore. I'm done. I've given as much. And see, so you started telling God, see, God, you don't know what it took for me to get to this point. You don't realize how hard I had to work, what I had to work through, who I had to forgive. You don't realize the tears that I cried, the pain that I felt. You get to this point, and he says, trust me. Watch, come on, Quinn, come on, just keep pouring in. Here we go. Let's, let's, let's start doing double time because my foot's starting to hurt again, so we're going to have to speed this. Now watch, here we go, here we go, here on me. Z, I'll be right back, buddy. I promise. I got you. Here you go. Let me give you guys some lemonade. I was going to bring Theo some, but I was just calling and asking you to pick up your own. So, uh, so, all right, so here he is, and Jesus is asking you to just keep giving. Now watch. Here we go. Here we go. Now watch. Here we go. Here, here. Give me that. There we go. There we go. Oh, man. There we go. Okay, cool. Who we got? Here. Here, get that to Z there. Here you go. Theo. Oh, my bad, Asia. There you go, Theo. There you go. All right, so there we, there, there we go. Cool, cool, cool. Let me see. All right, Jesus, you're going to have to help me out here, okay? You're going to have to take this back to, to Ricky and Sandra, and you can flip a coin about who gets it in the sound booth. All right? Yeah. There you go. So imagine God asks you to just keep giving and keep giving and keep giving, and all of a sudden you're empty out. You got nothing left to give. You know what they call that? They call that church burnout. They, call, they say, that's when you reach a point in your life where you just say, I'm tired, Jesus. I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. But here's the thing that I love about the story is that God provided for everybody. Basically, in this room, everybody has some lemonade. But watch what happens when they had all eaten enough. He said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Let's do some Bible trivia. How many, how many disciples did Christ have? So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over for those who had been, who had eaten. Now, watch this. Here's the crazy part. See, when you think you've ran out, God can always provide more. See, I can take this right now. I can go out to the streets. I can go back to the children's room and feed those little mongrels or give them juice. See, I can go out to the highways and the byways, and I can, I can get more. Now, listen, here's the crazy thing, Quentin. You ready? When this runs out, I can go back to the source, and I can get more. And listen, when that one runs out, I can go back to the source, and I can get more. And when that one runs out, I can go back to the See, here's the thing about God. Is he never runs out. See, the problem is not that God can't provide. The problem is this, is that we're so worried about what we got that we don't trust God with it. Here, let me give you, let me give you, let me give you a word of encouragement. You cannot outgive God. Amen. You can hold on to that bottle for the rest of your life, and you're going to die with that one bottle, never knowing the power of God when you give him your every. Watch this next scripture. Go to this next scripture. It says this. After the people saw the sign Jesus had performed, 
They begin to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Why is it so important that we become a counterculture? You ready? Here's why it's important. Because there's a world that needs to know that Jesus is alive and well and on his throne. And he has a place for them. Watch what it says in Luke 9, 62. It says, Jesus replied, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back. It's fit to service in the kingdom of heaven. What is that saying? Listen to me real close. Saying this. I don't look at what I have. I look at who has my life, and his name is Jesus. Come on up here. I, I, I don't look back at what I've been through. Because if I start looking back at what I've been through, listen, if I start focusing on what it took for me to get to this place, then I miss. I miss God. See, I can tell y'all story after story. Quentin knows so many stories when I've called him at three o'clock in the morning, when I've called at one o'clock in the morning, when I was going through my darkest moment in my life, when I called him in tears and just like, I can't do this anymore. See, he knows those stories, but see, I can't focus on that because if I focus on that, then I start placing my own energy and my own value into the things that I'm doing. I start saying, you know what? The only reason that North still has four walls is because of me. And listen, that's not true. The, the, it's not Ricky that built this thing. It's the power and, and the wisdom that Christ gave Ricky, and he'll tell you that. It's not me that stands on this platform and preaches the gospel. It's God speaking through me. You know, church, we can be like everybody else. Tomorrow, we're going to go pass out candy. And we can go out there, watch. And we can take a piece of candy and we can stick it in someone's bucket and send them through like they're a bunch of mule. Say, here you go. See you later. We can, God can put somebody in our life and we can treat them like they're just another number. We can go out to the restaurant after we leave here today and we can treat our server like they're just another worker. We can be different. We can be different. Yeah, we've had a rough week. Maybe you had a rough day. But you're going to give your all because you know God will replenish Man, you, you, you don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. But I'm going to give what I got because I know that God will provide where I'm lacking. See, I can go through my life and I can worry about me and mine. Or I can say, hey, I asked you at church this morning, everything okay? See, I, I can look at Quentin and say, Quentin, you see this bottle right here? See, in order for me to get to this place, I had to go through some things. See, I had, I had to cry some tears, and I had to do this. Or I, or I could say, hey, Quentin, you see, here, here's the thing. Just like you, I'm not perfect. But where I lack, my Father provides, and he has more than enough. And I can remember my moment when Christ took my empty vessel, and he filled it with him, and he used me for his glory. Here's my question to us, North. Do we stay where we are? Do we stay in this place? Do we run the race that God has called us to, to run? Yeah, it's going to be hard. The fire's going to get hot. You're going to have to deal with some people that you just don't want to deal with. You, you're going to have to give even when you feel like you don't have to give. But, but here, here, here's what we hold on to. Where I lack, God provides. What I don't have, God has. My imperfections, God uses them for his glory. My worries, God uses them for his glory. My stressors, God uses them for his glory. My, my downfalls, God will use them for his glory. So I'm not going to focus on those things. I'm going to place them in the hands of my daddy, and I'm going to say, God, whatever I have, you have, you use, because I trust you with it. This last slide, it has two different ways that we can write this. I think both ways are important. Punctuation holds a very huge part in our life. We can say, let's go, North. Like, let's go. Let's, let's move up, North. We're we, we going. We're moving up. Or we can say, let's go, North. Let's do this thing. I don't know about you, and I couldn't decide. But I feel like we need to be doing both. We need to be moving up. 
but we got to be moving. We got to be moving. We want to be different. We want to be counterculture. We want to do that. It starts right now. It starts with us saying, God, what I have is yours. This building, it's not complete, but it's yours. My life, it's not perfect, but it's yours. My past, it's checkered, but it's yours. My time, it is yours. The world tells me that I should value that thing, but I can't because it's yours. So you use it. Look at somebody and say, let's go north. From this day forward, we're going to be a different church. We're going to go against the grain. We're going to stand out because we're standing up for Jesus. As the worship team makes their way up here this morning, they're singing a song. It's a medley. And this medley, it has two of my favorite songs in it. It has reckless love, and it has spirit of God, I believe is what it's called. But it's, it talks about how Christ's love for us is reckless. And then the other song says, it's your breath in my lung. That is this entire series in a, in a nutshell. God, you sought me, you found me, even in my worst. So everything that I have is yours. Today, let's make this the anthem. The beginning of something great that God is going to do right here at this church. Amen. Let's stand up. Let's worship this morning.
<laughs> I didn't know if I was saying double or not. <laughs> Y'all give uh, Vince and worship thing a round of applause. I know if I give me giving him a hard time calling him Gimpy McGee, but I know that gal sucks. So to get up here and preach a message and work through that, that's it takes a lot. Uh, so y'all make sure y'all pat him on the back and pray for his foot and maybe stomping on your way out the door. <laughs> I'm kidding, don't stomp his foot. Uh, if you did, don't tell him I told you to. But we got a few announcements. Uh, don't forget tonight we're having our youth Halloween party. If you know anybody, 5th or 12th grade, everybody's invited. Make sure whatever costume they're wearing, you're okay standing before the Lord with it. That's all the advice I'm going to give you. If you're not okay standing before God in your costume, don't come to church. <laughs> we're going to have a costume contest, though. Uh, we've got a couple prizes we're going to give out. we got a lot of games. we got a lot of cool different kinds of food coming. So it's going to be a fun time. Uh, then tomorrow we're, we'll be at Nathan Dean uh, giving out candy to the community. So I'd encourage everybody that can to come out. Uh, they start at 5, I believe Vince said, about 3.30, 4 o'clock. We're going to get there, set up, get everything ready to go just so as they come through, we're already ready to start passing out and we're not scrambling. Uh, we'll get more details tomorrow. Uh, once we know where we're at, we'll give more details out on Facebook about where you need to come, where you need to go to help be a part of that. If you forgot candy today, I promise you, you can still bring it tomorrow. We will not complain. You can just bring it with you to Nathan Dean. Uh, pile it up. I know this looks like a lot of candy, but from what I've heard, there's going to be a whole lot of kids there. And uh, I said it on Wednesday night Bible study, we don't want to be that one piece of candy church because they're going to remember that church just like they remember the church with all the candy bars. Uh, but, let's see, Wednesday night Bible study, I don't know who's leading it this Sunday, I mean this Wednesday. Make sure you join us on Facebook, 645 um, if you interested, I don't know if he wanted me to put this out there, but if you're interested in leading Bible study, come see me or Vince. I'm not promising you're going to get to, but come see us. Uh, we're looking for some other people to get rotated in just so there's a new face on there and y'all not getting bored with seeing me and him. Uh, I believe that's it. Uh, Saturday, you know what time y'all going to start? Or we're going to start? Saturday we're having a work day. I, Eric told me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We'll have more information on that. Saturday we will have a work day. As Vince said, there's a lot of flooring going in here, going out there, going all through here. Uh, so we're going to need a ton of help. I know we're starting on it Saturday. I don't know exactly what time we'll get all that information out on Facebook. Like we always tell y'all, keep up with Facebook because that's where we usually, that's where we start putting details about stuff out at. Uh, but I think that's it. I'm on close us out in our last part of worship like Vince said there's a lot going on obviously uh, you know this uh, the the drum booth back here all the flooring you, uh, we've already got it here but you know that money was put away for emergency funds and uh, you know if we didn't have any giving we wanted the church to be able to keep going so we need to replace all that so we can keep this church alive and growing and uh, being a voice inside this community so I would encourage you all to dig as deep as you possibly can <laughs> and give so that we can continue to do God's work inside this building and outside this building. Uh, but I'm on, you can give online or you can give up here, give up here at church. Ugh, sorry, cash or check. Or you can get on the Givelify app. All that's real simple. You just hit give now. It, it'll pop up your location and everything. But I'm going to close this out in a word of prayer. And as you give, you are dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come for today, God, I just ask, Lord, that we take the message that you've given us this morning, the worship that you apply in our hearts, and we take it out in this lost and dying world, and we let this world know who our King is, Lord. God, I ask that we become the future of North and not just the history of North, Lord, that we pick up our cross and we run ahead, Lord, that we go ahead with you wherever you may lead us, God. We have the boldness and the faith to step out on, Lord. God, I thank you that you bless our tithes and offering as we give, God. You multiply that within this church and this church within this community, God, and you multiply it within our own lives, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.